Workforce, Chicago turned disaster into opportunity. Many architects made their mark, but one did more than design buildings. Daniel Burnham was commissioned to come up with a long-term plan for the entire city. He was tasked with designing a beautiful waterfront, lush green spaces, and parks that every citizen could walk and enjoy. This plan for Chicago laid the foundation for a city that would grow with beauty and grace for more than a century to come. To grow, Chicago needed to replace its lost buildings. Before the Great Fire, most cities were built from wood, but Chicago had learned its lesson. New building codes required steel skeletons and firewalls, and these new rules meant architects were in even higher demand. At first, the architects tried to dress up these steel skeletons in the ornate style of the day, but some saw the chance to create something truly new. And in 1938, a famous architect from Germany arrived in Chicago, ready to do just that. Mies van der Rohe was known as the master of European modernism and a father of the Bauhaus movement. While he designed a few skyscrapers himself, he really came to Chicago to shape young minds, heading up the School of Architecture at the Armour Institute. He encouraged architects to embrace the beauty of their new materials, not to hide them, but to let them out. Soon you can see evidence of this new philosophy throughout the city. A renaissance in American architecture was underway, and Chicago was a shining star. In 1955, another genius surfaced in Chicago. His name was Fosler Kahn. They called him the Einstein of structural engineering. He was inventing new ways to create buildings taller than anyone had dreamed. Kahn took a job with the prestigious firm of Skidmore, Owings & Merrill and was soon partnered with Bruce Graham, one of Chicago's most respected architects. By the 60s, the team was designing buildings throughout the city, and thanks to structural innovations by Fosler, some of them were actually starting to live up to the name Skyscraper. But their best was yet to come. By the middle of the decade, change was sweeping America. New ways of thinking meant new tastes and styles. And if America wanted something, Sears, Roebuck and Company always seemed to have it, in four sizes and three colors. Sales and the company kept growing and growing. By 1968, Sears had 7,000 employees working in offices scattered throughout Chicago. Recognizing the need for efficiency, someone floated the idea of all employees under one roof. The only question was, could you build a big enough roof? Sears wanted to know how much space they'd need, both initially when they moved in, and for the future, decades down the road. So Sears hired some consultants, and those consultants had the latest in cutting-edge technology at their disposal. They called it a computer. They collected mountains of data about how Sears employees worked, when they worked, what they did while they worked. You get the idea. They fed all this data into the computer and got their answer. A building that big was going to take some big thinking. And that's where Fosler Khan and Bruce Graham came in. One day over lunch, Khan was explaining his bundled tubes idea to Graham. Trying to visualize the idea, Graham pulled out a handful of cigarettes and arranged them at different heights. The design would be made up of nine bundled tubes at the base. Two of the tubes would end at the 50th floor, two more at the 66th floor, three at the 90th floor, leaving the tallest two to continue to the top. While Sears wasn't trying to break any world records at first, they quickly decided to expand their plans and go for the record of world's tallest building. That meant building a structure 110 stories tall with nearly 4.6 million square feet of interior space. Word quickly got out, and overnight, everyone wanted to be a part of a new world record. Sears wanted the perfect location for their new world record home, so they purchased two city blocks near the Chicago River and Chicago's famous Loop. And in August 1970, they broke ground. The project was so big that it took a year before the foundation was complete and the iron workers could get started. To keep things on schedule, giant sections of the building were partially constructed off-site. This allowed the massive structure to shoot up almost two floors each week. As the structure reached ever higher, building conditions got more difficult. Winds were much stronger at the top, and temperatures could be as much as 20 degrees colder than at street level. But they kept at it, and after another two years of hard work, the steel skeleton was complete. Then it was time for the hundreds of finishing carpenters, plumbers, and electricians to get to work. And they brought along 145,000 lights, 25,000 miles of pipe, 43,000 miles of wiring, 104 elevator cars, 992 toilets, and 796 faucets. Not to mention 16,100 tinted windows. In the fall of 1973, they put on the finishing touches so Sears could move into their new home, Chicago's number one icon and the 
the tallest building in the world. Before long, the tower started to feel like home. And by home, I mean a place where thousands of people like you came through every day. The Sears people were very proud, and they embraced their local and international guests. As times change, the tower changed too. In 1982, the world's tallest building got even taller when two radio and TV antennas and another 287 feet were added to the overall tower height, broadcasting signals into four states. And over time, the tower grew to be a city within a city, complete with coffee shops, a bakery, variety of restaurants, a health club, a car wash, a bank, doctors and dentists, a conference center, even its own post office. But the thing visitors really wanted to see most was the sky deck and its breathtaking views, and they weren't disappointed. The tower sky deck has always been and remains one of Chicago's must-see destinations. After holding the world's tallest building record for 22 years, the tower was surpassed in 2004 by the 1,473-foot Taipei 101 Tower in Taiwan. But thanks to the TV antennas, Chicago's tower held on to the world's tallest structure record at 1,730 feet. And to add to its impressive numbers, today's tenants recycle a whopping 445 tons of paper a year, sparing 3,500 trees. Other efforts have cut water use by 10 million gallons per year and carbon emissions by 51 million pounds since the tower was built. So while the tower might be sleek and black on the outside, it's quite green on the inside. An inside that's home to world-class broadcast facilities, customer call centers, and over 100 different companies including law firms, financial institutions, and insurance brokers. Even decades after its completion, the tower is still considered one of the world's premier addresses for business. Up to 25,000 people pass through its doors every day, and the tower draws well over 1 million Skydeck visitors annually. They flock from every corner of the globe to experience views unmatched in America's heartland. And the team from Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill is still making an impact on the tower. They designed the ledge, four retractable glass-floored viewing areas that extend over four feet outside the west side of the Skydeck. This engineering marvel puts you 1,353 feet out over the city. You'll feel like you're walking in mid-air, 103 floors above Wacker Drive and the Chicago River. In early 2009, a London-based insurance broker, the Willis Group, became one of the tower's largest tenants, bringing even more great jobs, excitement, and prestige to the tower. Along with their office space, the lease included a right to change the name of the building, which is why the impressive structure you're standing in today is now known as Willis Tower. Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoyed learning a little more about Chicago's history and the remarkable story of Willis Tower. As the years go by, the tower stands tall in its place as one of the greatest buildings in the world. Have a wonderful time at Skydeck Chicago, and we hope to see you again soon.